Hello, and welcome back to another fabulous episode of I Am Free. Now what? With me, Michelle Fortier, a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Florida with a focus on people involved in the criminal justice system, the friends, families, associates, all those people. And of course, I do trauma and some self-harming all this other stuff. So anyway, welcome back to another fabulous episode. So today we are going to be doing a little something that helps with anxiety and depression. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a little something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And what that is, it was started by Beck and Ellis. Ellis added some rational stuff in there and Beck is like the father of CBT. And CBT stands for cognitive, which are our thoughts, behavior, which obviously is our behavior. And then we have therapy. So what we're doing is we're addressing our thoughts and our behaviors. And CBT has been shown to be enormously effective for depression, and for anxiety. And I'm going to go over a little bit of that today. Now, this right here, I drew it out. I love this thing. I got this life problem solver. I got this whole thing way back in the day, 2008. 2007, 2008, when I was in my graduate program at Florida Atlantic University at Boca Raton, nice and fancy, right? And this right here, we had learned this, and of all things, I took a couples therapy class, and we learned all about it in there. And so what this is right here is the first circle that we have, that's the event. That's what happens. Then we have our thoughts about the event, and our thoughts lead to our emotions, which then lead to our behavior. So, for example, right here, got into an argument with my spouse. Thoughts could be, my God, I'm so stupid, she's going to leave me, it's gonna be a thousand times awful, I can't believe I did this, or that stupid bitch, I can't believe she said those things, that's absolutely awful, how does she disrespect me? So if we say, how dare she disrespect me, this is absolutely awful, does she not know who she's talking to? When we say those sorts of thoughts about the event, those sorts of thoughts cause us to be angry. And I'm sorry if I'm a little sweaty. The AC in our, in our office today is broken, but I needed to get a video out to everybody because that's what I have to do. So I, excuse me for the sweatiness. And of course, because I get so excited, that increases the sweat factor too. So just excuse the glistening. So anyway, so you're in the argument, you get into the argument, you start thinking, or if your uh, partner's male, that stupid, sorry, son of a bitch, I can't believe I keep him around. Does he know who he's talking to? How dare he disrespect me? When you start saying those things to yourself, what you start doing is you start getting those feelings of anger, right? And if you think those things, if you think that sorry son of a bitch, I can't believe he talked to me that way, of course you're going to get angry. And then what is the behavior that we have if we get angry? Well, we start slamming doors, we start carrying on, we start picking fights, we start doing all these other things that actually will make our situation worse. The other thing is if we sit there and we say, I can't believe I made them so upset. This is awful. They're totally gonna leave me. This is gonna be the most awful thing ever. Why am I such a screw up? I'm unlovable. When you say those sorts of things about the event, what then occurs is that we get depressed, we get sad, we get fearful, we get anxious about our relationships. So we then have those sorts of feelings. Now mind you, that first bubble, the event has not changed in either one of those scenarios. Yet, our thoughts, when they're different, they change our feelings, which then change the way that we behave. So if we then instead start saying to ourselves, oh my God, my significant other is gonna leave me, this is gonna be awful, how could I be so stupid, blah, 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 the feelings are gonna be depressed, and then the behaviors 
depressed and anxious and the behaviors could be you know crying in your room or you know chasing after them to make sure that they don't leave me so and all of those are not very effective behaviors to deal with the event itself so what does behaviors or what are some of the thoughts that we can have if we want behaviors of being able to communicate effectively with our significant other even if we're getting into an argument our thoughts need to remain rational and so it would seem like okay i'm getting into an argument with my significant other if i think hmm they have a good point right there i should probably work on that or hmm that doesn't make much sense i should ask for some clarification that right there is much more helpful than say, not sorry, son of a bitch, disrespects me. If you instead say, you know what, my significant other right now is just very upset. I can see that they're upset. And I know that this is not typical of them. Let me go and ask some additional questions. So the feeling then is of concern for your significant other, that you're kind of worried about what's going on with them. Are they feeling okay? Is everything going okay? Is there anything that you can do to help with this situation? Is the relationship something that is um, that you um, are hearing that needs work? And so instead of sitting there and getting, um, you know, uh, thinking these very negative thoughts, that your partner disrespects you or that your partner is going to leave you over an argument, you're then able to start thinking in a different way, which leads to different emotions. And it, let, and it leads to less severe reactions. It's one thing to be anxious, it's a tiny bit. It's something else to be extremely fearful and wanting to go and run away from the situation or run towards it because of how high your anxiety is. So this right here. Now, if it turns out that your thinking is completely appropriate and it is something that um, is based in reality, then there's different things that you can do to cope with the event. So one of them is you can change the event. You can stop arguing. You can decide different ways to handle your situation besides arguing. You can avoid the event. So if it's something that you can avoid. So say you get into an argument um, every day when your wife gets home, she's still stressed from work, and you already know that. You can go and you can avoid that argument by calling and saying, hey, you know, is there anything that I can do to kind of help with de-stressing you before I get home? I notice that you're very anxious, that you're very worried, that you have a lot on your mind. So you can avoid the argument to begin with. You can also cope with the event. So you already know that she's going to be stressed when you get home because she had a rough day and blah, 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 blah. And you can learn to cope with this additional stress in your life because she is going to be stressed. You can also change the feelings about the event. And what that means is instead of getting upset that your wife is upset and you get into this argument, you can then decide that you're going to give her the benefit of the doubt and be kind to her and understanding that she's gone through a lot of stuff and not take it personal. Now, one of the things that happens in cognitive behavioral therapy is they have something that we call cognitive distortions. And cognitive distortions, we know, are in a, ineffective ways to look at a situation. And so with that, there are some common ones. One of them is called black and white thinking. That's where things are either all good or all bad. There are no shades of gray. So your partner during a fight is the biggest son of a bitch under the sun, and at other times, the sweetest person under the sun. Instead of seeing shades of gray and saying, well, sometimes my partner um, struggles a little bit, sometimes my partner does a little bit better, and all of it is okay. He is not one or the other, is lots of shades of gray. It's complex, there's a lot of complexity. Putting things in black and white like that can make it much more difficult to cope. So looking for shades of gray, black and white thinking, big cognitive distortion. The other one is jumping to a conclusion. And that is a huge cognitive distortion, especially if you grew up in an abusive household. So one of the things that I always give as an example is you're at home and your significant other goes, 
Well, if you grew up in an abusive household, you knew, oh crap, this is where the drama comes in. I hear that heavy sigh, this is not gonna go good. But if we don't jump to that conclusion that this is absolutely awful, that they're plotting and planning against us, when they make that heavy sigh, we can just say, ah, oh, they did a heavy sigh. We're not going inside their brain and assuming what it is that heavy sigh is about. We can ask what the heavy sigh is about, but we're not gonna jump to a conclusion about the heavy sigh. Because a lot of the times when we jump to conclusions, the conclusions that we jump to are usually wrong. And then we get all distressed for absolutely no good reason. Another one is where we catastrophize. And that one is where it is the worst thing that could ever happen. This is absolutely awful. And quite honestly, most things in this world are not the absolute worst. There's probably things that are worse than that. And when we catastrophize, we make the problem seem so insurmountable that we become overwhelmed with it. And that will push us into uh, depressive thoughts and depressive feelings because if we think it's the worst thing ever, then how are we gonna climb through that? It's gonna be extremely difficult. So that's making a mountain out of a molehill. Another one, Beck, I think it was, it was either Beck or Ellis, said that we are shooting and musting all over the place. When we say that strong word of, it should be like this, you should treat me better, this is the way it should be, we are putting our will on the world. And guess what? The world don't care about our will. So this whole thing that it should be like this, it shouldn't be like that, it's irrelevant how we think it should or shouldn't be. It is what it is. And when we say should, we tend to get very, very angry. And we often have to look at, to reduce that anger, is who said should? Who said it must be like this? It makes absolutely no sense. The next one, the next big cognitive distortion is something called emotional reasoning. And this one is, I feel this way, therefore it must be true. I feel like you are up to no good, so therefore you must be up to no good. Mm. Sometimes our feelings can give us good information, but sometimes our feelings have to be checked Sometimes our feelings are based on a whole bunch of our history and not on any of the current facts. So to say that something is true simply because you feel that way is a huge cognitive distortion that's gonna put a lot of distance between you and the people that you care about and is gonna drive you bonkers. The last one is labeling. So one of the big things, here we go, talking about my DBT, favorite thing under the sun. But in DBT, we have a really non-judgmental standpoint. And what that means is that we leave off labels, like good or bad. And the reason that we do this is because then we can address the root cause of the problem and not have to sit there and deal with all that nonsense on top. What this looks like is, I'm so stupid, how could I be so dumb? Label, label. None of them are helpful. Or, you are so stupid, how could you be so dumb? Label, label. Doesn't do anything to address the problem. So what this looks like if you're addressing the problem is instead of saying, you are so stupid, how could you have thought that that would have been a good thing to do? This is what it looks like. I am not happy that you put the um, can of paint on top of the car without the lid on it. And, and when it spilled all over the place, it caused a lot of problems. So you actually brought up what the issue is instead of labeling. Because if you then said, significant other, you are so stupid, you left that can of paint on top of the car. Now you're fighting over your significant other being called stupid and not fixing the problem about the paint on top of the car and who's going to fix the issue now that there's paint all over the car. So those are the biggest cognitive distortions, and I hope that they helped you recognize some of your cognitive distortions that might be causing you depression and anxiety, and I hope you find 
this little life problem solver to be helpful for you. And what you're going to do with this is when you identify the unhelpful thoughts that lead to the feelings that are unhelpful, that lead to the behaviors that are unhelpful, you are then instead going to think of more helpful thoughts that do not fall into cognitive distortions. So you're going to think of things that allow you to feel the way that is most effective and allow you to have behaviors that are most effective. So if you have any questions or comments, do not, do not, um, do not um, feel like you should not leave them. Leave them in the comments section and I will answer them as soon as possible. If you have anything personal uh, that you would like to discuss and you don't wanna leave it in the comments section, go ahead, hit me up on Instagram and I will be sure to get those with, get you answers for those. I am stumbling over my words. It is too damn hot in this office. All right, take care. I wish you um, continued freedom and I wish you good mental health. Take care.